Let us pray. A great God in heaven, we thank you so very much for the Bible study today. Thank you for your children. Thank you for those who are faithful. And they come every time to this Bible study. And in all the various districts and cities and regions and states and various countries where they come for this Bible study. And they faithfully attend every week so that they can have the knowledge of the Lord and they can go deeper into the things of the Lord. We are praying, Lord, that you reward their faithfulness in Jesus' name. For those who are here tonight and for those who will be hearing, the time they will be hearing, we are praying, O oh Lord, the blessing of obedience and faithfulness will be upon every one of us and every one of them in Jesus' name. We are praying that tonight your word will fall in fertile ground. Receptive hearts, believing hearts, a heart set on fire for the Lord, so that, Lord, this word will do good in every life in Jesus' name. And we pray that you help us to profit spiritually by the word. In Jesus' name we pray. I welcome every one of you to the Bible study tonight, and I want you to know that I appreciate your faithfulness and your interest and desire to know more about the things of the Lord. And because you come regularly, you are increasing in the knowledge of the Lord. I want to encourage you that you will make it a point of responsibility, that you talk to all the members of the church, and you impress it upon them, the importance of the studies we're having at this time in this series in the book of Revelation. Especially now we're finishing the second session, and we'll soon be going to the third session, which is really the prophetic session. Very, very important for the church and for every Christian. And it's a portion of scripture that many people do not understand. And we need to come and receive the key of knowledge and the key of understanding so that those prophetic writings of the Lord will be made open unto us. Make it then a point of responsibility or duty that when you are coming next week you come with others work on them talk to them evangelize them if you want to use that language put pressure on them gently plead with them and put all the pressure you need to put on everyone that you know and bring them along and that goes for the same thing in all locations where you are listening to the bible study we need to encourage your people that the bible study is very important and they need to keep coming. Today we're looking at Revelation chapter 3. In Revelation chapter 3, we're looking at the last church. The last church. We're looking at Revelation chapter 3 from verse 14. It says, Unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, This thing says the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that what cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increase with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white trimmed, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand and the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh, will I grant to eat with me in my, in my throne, to sit with me in my throne, I, even as I also overcame. And I am set down with my father in his throne. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. I pray we'll have ears to hear in Jesus' name. 
you'll see this church we are studying today that Jesus Christ wrote to. If you go back to verse 14, it says, Unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. When it says Laodiceans, the name of the city itself was Laodicea. And the people there are referred to as Laodiceans. Laodicea, Laodiceans. Nigeria, Nigerians. Ghana, Ghanaian. And so, the city was Laodicea. And a church had been planted there. And the ministers of God administered faithfully in that church. But now the Lord comes to the church. And he looks at that church and he evaluates the spiritual temperature of that church. And it says, you are neither cold nor hot. You are lukewarm. And the Lord didn't appreciate, didn't like, and he didn't commend the condition of the church there. Before we go into the message that Christ gave to that church... Why don't we look at those who have ministered in that church? So you will understand, they didn't lack opportunity of people that had effective ministry. Look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 1. Colossians chapter 2, verse 1. For I would that he knew what great conflict I have for you, and for them at Laodicea. And for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. Here was Paul writing to the Colossians. And Colossae was very near Laodicea. And the, the Lord had used uh, Paul to write to the Colossians. And he was writing to them saying, I have a great conflict for you. Conflict in intercession. Conflict in prayer. Conflict in designing the very best for you. I'm always remembering you. And not you alone at Colossae. I remember the people in Laodicea. What great conflict I have for you. And I have for the Laodiceans too. And it wasn't only Paul the Apostle in Colossians chapter 4. I'm reading to you from verse 12. Epaphras who is one of you, a servant of Christ, salutes you. Always laboring fervently for you in prayers that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Here we find another minister, Epaphras, joining with Paul the Apostle. And Epaphras was concerned for the people at Colossae. What did he want for them? He wanted them to stand perfect in all the will of God. Look at verse 13 for I bear him record that he has a great zeal for you. And them that are in Laodicea and them in Hierapolis. You will see that this Epaphras, he also had a great concern for the people in Laodicea. What did he want for them? He wanted them to be perfect and to be complete in the will of God. Verse 15, salute the brethren that are in Laodicea. Salute the brethren that are in Laodicea. Here was a church that started well. Here was a church that had the privilege of having Paul the Apostle and Epaphras ministering to them, preaching to them, writing to them. Not only that, he wrote to them because this letter to the Colossians will be given to the people in Laodicea. Look at verse 16. And when this epistle is read among you, cause it to be read also in the church of the Laodiceans. Don't keep this abuse to yourself. All the things I'm saying here about the beauty of Christ and the glory of Christ and the wisdom of Christ and the grace of God and the salvation of the Lord and the love of God and heaven to come and the very fact that we're risen with Christ and because of that we should be seeking the things that are above where Christ is seated on the right hand of God. As that message is challenging your heart in Colossae, Pass it on to Laodicea so that the people in Laodicea will set their affections on things above and not on things on the earth. Because remind them, as I'm reminding you, that they are dead and their life is hid with Christ in God. Remind them, please, when they read this epistle, that when Christ who is alive shall appear, then shall ye also in Colossae and in Laodicea appear with him in glory. That's the kind of church that Christ is writing to today. But by the time that Jesus Christ wrote to this church, the effect, the influence, the impact of the ministry of Paul the Apostle and of Epaphras and of all the others and of the epistles they read, all those things had vanished away. All that Jesus had to say to this church was that you are neither cold nor hot. 
And I would rather that you are cold or hot. I would want you to be on the one, on one side. Whether you are cold, then I will know you don't have any interest in me at all. Or you are hot, then I will know that you are fervent and you are serious and you are zealous and you are willing to sell all and give all and be totally abandoned unto the Lord. But before Jesus Christ spoke to the church, come back to Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. He introduced himself. Look at what he said. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write. This thing says the amen. The faithful and a true witness. The beginning of the creation of God. Here is the introduction that Jesus Christ gave to himself before he spoke to the church. Number one he said, I am the amen. The amen means he is the one that affirms only what is true. And that what he has promised and what he threatens is certain. Because all the promises of God, all the warnings of God, all the threatenings of God are yes and amen in Christ. He is the amen. As the amen is characterized with sincerity and truth. Hence, he looks on lukewarmness, on indifference, on half-heartedness, on complacency, on self-satisfaction, on half-heartedness and self-deception with displeasure. He is the amen. He is the faithful one. He is the true witness because of that. He will not approve. He cannot approve anything that's of insincerity or hypocrisy. He is a witness for God and a witness for the truth of God. And because of that, he can only approve what God approves. And he cannot approve anything that Almighty God does not approve. He introduced himself the amen, the faithful and the true witness. Then he said another thing. In that verse 14, he said, I am the beginning of the creation of God. What does that mean? Oh, there are some people that will tell you that that means that he was the first one to be created. After God had created him, then God began to now create all the things and all the people. Not so. You must compare scripture with scripture. For you to understand what it means when it says, I'm the beginning of the creation of God. Before I tell you the word, that word beginning, the root word, the Greek word, the meaning of that word itself. Let's turn back to John chapter 1. In John chapter 1 verse 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. And without him was nothing made, was not anything made that was made. That's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And here he is referred to as creator. He is referred to as the originator of everything you see and even things that you cannot see. Let's go back to the Colossians we read before. In Colossians chapter 1 verse 16. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. For by him, talking about Jesus Christ, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. You see the exalted position of the Lord Jesus Christ. He created all things. And they were created for his glory. You turn to Hebrews chapter 1. Reading there in verse 2. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2. And he has in these last days spoken unto us by his son. Whom he has appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds. By Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ, all that you see, everything in the world was made. Look at this in verse 6. And again, when he bringeth the first begotten into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. This is the creator himself. This is the one that made all things himself. In verse 10, it says, Thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth. The heavens and the walls of thine are the works of thine hand. They shall perish, but thou remainest. They, are, they shall all wax old as a garment, and as a vesture shall thou fold them up. And they shall be changed, but thou art the same. And the years fail not. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now come to Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. The beginning of the creation of God. The meaning of that word beginning means the first cause. 
the first cause. That is the one that causes everything to be. The one that causes everything to exist. The one that causes everything to appear. The first cause, the originator of the creation of God. That's what beginning. When you use the word beginning, it's not just the beginning in time. It's the beginning in everything. That it was the first cause, it was the originator, the author of the creation of God. When you think about Jesus Christ, he is the amen. He is a faithful one. And he is the true witness. And he is the originator and the author. And the first cause, the beginning of the creation of God. What knowledge and power and strength and authority and wisdom he has. He knows all things. And he can do all things. As he comes to this church. And the one that could see everything, that knows everything, that made everything. He diagnosed spiritual sickness in the Laodicean church. And he diagnosed them as being lukewarm. And then he prescribed spiritual remedy, which will bring them back to spiritual health. Like Esau of old that said, I have enough. I'm all right. I have everything. He didn't have the blessing of the father. He didn't have the blessing of Abraham. He didn't have the approval of the father. And yet he said, I'm all right. I have everything. The same thing in the Laodicean church. I am rich and increase with goods. And I have need of nothing. And yet Jesus Christ is saying, but you are wretched and you are miserable and you are poor and you are naked and you are blind. They thought they were all right, but nothing was all right in their midst or in their lives. They were conceited and so they said they were rich and had need of nothing while they were Christless. They had no hope of heaven. They said they were all right. They had no salvation. They said they were all right. Christ was outside the door, knocking at the door, wishing and desiring that somebody will open the door and he will come in. Christ was outside the Laodicean church. They were Christless and lifeless and without salvation. And he said they were rich and had need of nothing and that they were increasing with goods. Meanwhile, the Lord is saying that you're only flattering yourself. And when you flatter yourself, you'll not be able to have what you ought to have. Are there people here tonight hearing this word of God? And they don't have Christ and they say they're all right. They don't have salvation. They say everything is okay. And they do not have that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And they carry on in religion. And they think that the religion is enough. And they have the fig leaves like Adam and Eve covering themselves. And in the sight of God, when they think they have covered themselves with all the fig leaves, they're still naked. And they are blind. They cannot see the future. They cannot see the glory of God. They cannot see the promises of God for them. And they do not have what they ought to have that will be a covering for their souls. And yet they say everything is all right with them. What deception self-satisfaction and pride that will not allow such people to yield to the word of God and say yes Lord I know my condition what you have said is true I need salvation I need Christ I need the hope of heaven in my soul I need the fire to burn hot within my soul I want you to be hot this cold situation is not all right look at their condition in Psalm 36 Psalm 36 verse 2 in Psalm 36, verse 2, for he flattereth himself in his own eyes until his iniquity be found to be hateful. He flattereth himself. Uh, you, you, you talk to them and you say, how about overcoming all these uh, sins and iniquities and evil deeds in your life? Don't talk to me like that. I'm all right. I'm a child of God. When did you come to church? You are talking to me like that. I know who I'm serving. I know my condition. Go, go your way and go and witness to another person. He flattereth himself in his own eyes until his iniquity be found to be hateful. As we look at this church, and Christ counsels this lukewarm church. We divide the passage itself into three parts. Number one, Christ's perception of the lukewarm. Christ's perception of the lukewarm. Number two, Christ's prescriptions to the lukewarm. It's like a doctor, the great physician, prescribing the remedy. Spiritual remedy, spiritual medicine, medication. But these lukewarm, anemic, lifeless, dying, Laodicean church. Christ's prescriptions to the lukewarm. Number three, Christ's precept and promise to the lukewarm. Christ's promise and precept 
to the lukewarm. Come back to number one, Christ's perception of the lukewarm. And can I tell you that this is different from man's perception? Obviously, as you come to a church like this, and there may be some religious people that go to other churches. They don't know you are not born again if you are not born again. They don't know that you are living a defeated life, a wretched life, a miserable life, a sinful life, a life that will lead you to hellfire. And, but because we are coming to a church like this, and there are some little, little outward changes, they're looking at you as if you have arrived already. And man's perception is telling you, ah, if I could have just the religion you have, if I could have the humility you have, if I can have the Christianity you have, I'll be all right. They do not understand. They do not know that you are not all right. And sometimes you deceive yourself because of that, because of man's perception about you. We're talking about Christ's perception. We're not talking about your own personal inward perception. You look at yourself because you don't know enough scripture. Because you do not know the yardstick. How God will weigh the actions of men. The life of men. The attitude of man. The disposition of man. The secret things that we do. Because you don't know how God evaluates us. You give yourself a pass mark. And you say, I'm trying. I'm doing my best. Since I came to this church, things have been totally different. We're not talking about man's perception. We're not talking about personal perception. We're not talking about your family's perception. There are many things you can hide away from the members of your family, from your father, from your mother, from your wife, from your husband, from your children, from your parents. There are many things we can hide away from them, and they will be saying, oh, I thank God for my husband. I thank God for my wife. I thank God for my children. Those children, they're just loyal and devoted and they're scriptural. In fact, I believe that if the rapture takes place now, the whole family will go into heaven. That's the family's perception. It doesn't count. Because Christ's perception, the amen and the faithful and the true witness, he can see through all the shades and all the shell and all the castle, all the things we build around ourselves. He knows our thoughts. He knows our lives. Therefore, we're talking about Christ's perception concerning this church and Christ's perception concerning you. We're not talking about your friend's perception. And sometimes we want to deceive ourselves and we're looking for the praise of men. Cheap praise. Cheap popularity. And we're looking for somebody to tell us something that will encourage us. We're feeling guilty. The Spirit of God is condemning us. And the Spirit of God is convicting us that you're not living right. Things are not okay with you. It's like you are falling within. You are defeated within. You are living a defeated sinful life within. And we're feeling condemned and we're feeling uneasy. Then we'll go to our friend because we want somebody to lift us up. And uh, we'll say, my friend, what do you think about me? The way I'm living my Christian life and the way I read the Bible, the way I go to the Bible study, the way I'm dedicated, the way I pay my tithes and offering, the way I dress and the way I, And your friend will say, you know, I, every time I look at you, I'm just happy. I know that you are a great, great child of God. In fact, uh, if they made you a worker, if they made you a preacher, I will not be surprised. And in no time, I know that you are going to rise up because you are, just, you are just the model of the Christian we're looking for. And you deceive yourself, you're happy because of the perception of your friend. But I'm telling you tonight, we're not talking about the perception of man. We're talking about the perception of Jesus Christ himself, the one that knows you through and through. That's why it says Christ's perception of the lukewarm. Look at verse 15 all through to verse 17. I know thy works. I know thy works. He always says that because he knows. Whether you, are in, whether you are in Ephesus or you are in Smyrna, he knows. Whether you are in Tyra or you are in Pagamos, he knows. Whether you are in Sardis or you are in Philadelphia, he knows. And whether you are in Laodicea or you are in Lagos, he knows. He knows your heart. He knows your works. He knows everything. I know thy works. That thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou art cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. And there are people that tell you that, you know, once you've given your life to Jesus Christ, I've read it to you in the Colossians, in Colossians chapter 2 and chapter 4. You know that these were brethren before. These were children of God before. These were people that loved the Lord before. 
And the ministers were laboring for them. All the ministers were thinking about was not for them to be perfect. But now they came to the position where Jesus said, I'm getting rid of you. I'm going to spill you out. I'm going to cast you out. I'm going to disinherit you. I'm going to dispossess you. I'm going to announce to the angels and to God, I never knew you. You are not part of my congregation. I will spill you out because you are lukewarm. Because thou sayest, I am rich. That's what he said. And increase with goods. And I have need of nothing. Are you sanctified? No, but I have need of nothing. You have the fire of God burning in your soul? No, but I have need of nothing. Do you have any interest, ardent, passionate interest in the things of the Lord? No, but I have need of nothing. Are you humble? No, but I have need of nothing. Are you obedient to the totality of the word of God? No, but I have need of nothing. Are you on your way to heaven? Shall the trumpet sound today? And should death strike you down and you die today? Do you have the assurance to get to heaven? No, but I have need of nothing. Can you see these people? They were not ready for death. They were not ready for the rapture. They were not ready for the coming of the Lord. And yet they said they had need of nothing. Are there people like that here today? That are so buried in religion. And all they have is this shell, castle, that they surround themselves with. And they feel everything is all right. And all you hear from them is, praise the Lord. Everything is all right. But everything is not all right. If there's no holiness, everything is not all right. If there is no humility, everything is not all right. If there is no passion, if there is no love, if there is no zeal, if there is no fire burning in your soul, everything is not all right. If there is no assurance of heaven, everything is not all right. If there is guilt in your heart, everything is not all right. If you died today and there is no hope of getting to heaven, everything is not all right. But he said, everything is all right. They, they were saying, I have need of nothing. And then Jesus said, thou knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And let's look at those things that Jesus said. As we look at the, the perception of the Lord, he said, number one, you are neither cold nor hot. If they were totally cold, what would that mean? Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew chapter 24, reading from verse 11, verse 11 and verse 12, to be cold, what does that mean? It tells us here, and many prof false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. So when Jesus said cold, what did he mean? You know, sometimes when we are talking, you say, why well, you are cold to me. In our relationship, our relationship is cold. It's like there's a cold war between us. You're not talking to me. And I know it. And I feel it. There's, there's coldness in our relationship. That's what Jesus meant. When he said hot, neither cold, cold in relationship, cold in love, cold in, uh, cold in fellowship, cold loss of sea, total apathy. You're neither that. You say come to church. You say carry the Bible. You say wear the label. You say write the writing. You say sing the songs. You're neither cold nor hot. What did he mean when he said hot? It means zealous. You're not zealous. Fervent. You are not fervent. You don't have the burning zeal and the ardent love for me. I can't see that. I look at, I look at John chapter 5, verse 35, talking about being hot, burning. In John chapter 5, verse 35, he, talking about John the Baptist, was a burning and shining light. And ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. Burning, shining light. And look at this in Acts of the Apostles chapter 18. Hot, zealous, fervent, ardent, passionate. In Acts chapter 18, verse 25, this man, talking about Apollos, this man was instructed in the way of the Lord. 
being fervent in spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And that's what Jesus meant by being hot. He said, on the one hand, you Laodiceans, you're neither cold nor hot. Those who are totally cold, they don't have any interest. They don't show any interest. And they don't even come near at all. They don't repeat anything. They don't read any part of the Bible. They don't uh, mutter any prayer unto me. But you are not like that. You are not totally cold. But on the other hand, you are not totally hot. And he said, I prefer that you are either cold or hot. Why would Jesus prefer that you are cold? Because when you are totally cold, when you don't have any interest, when you don't come to church, when you don't profess that you know Jesus, when you don't profess you are a friend of Jesus, it's easier to reach you. Look at Saul of Tarsus. He was cold to the Lord. He was opposed to the Lord. He was fervent for the devil. It was easy to reach him. Look at Judas Iscariot. Neither cold nor hot. He will follow after Jesus Christ. He saw all the miracles. He ate, you know, the bread that was multiplied. He said, I am part of them too. But was not totally inside. He was neither cold. He was not an open, opposed enemy, adversary. But was not a friend. He was not fervent. And was not passionate. It was not totally given and soul committed, consecrated unto the Lord. It was very difficult to reach Judas Iscariot. Jesus said, one of you will betray me. Is it I? Is it I? Is it I? And Judas Iscariot said, is it I? And Jesus said, thou hast said. But he couldn't reach that man. A person that is in between. It's very difficult to reach. He is hypocritical. He will not accept. He is insincere. He will not accept. He loves money more than God. He will not accept. Preach all the messages you want to preach in every convention, in every retreat, in every camp meeting, or in every Sunday worship, or in every Bible study. He will not accept that anything is wrong. I'm all right. I am rich. And increase with goods. And I have need of nothing. You can preach to other people. The people that are neither cold nor hot, they are in the middle. They are very, very difficult to reach. That's why Jesus said, I'll prefer. If you are totally cold, it will be easy to preach to you. If you are totally cold and opposed and you are not interested in the things of God, then I can talk to you. I can reach you. Look at some of our people who are here. And they've been here for many, many years. And now when you talk about their prayer lives, neither cold nor hot. You talk about their evangelism, neither cold nor hot. You talk about humility, saying, I am sorry whenever they are wrong. No, never. Neither cold nor hot. They know all the arguments. They know all the verses. They know all the scriptures. They know all the doctrines. And they have a lot of cassettes at home. They have a lot of books at home. They know all the songs. They can sing all the songs. They know all the preachers. Very difficult to reach people. Because they're neither cold nor hot. That's why Jesus said, why don't you move either to this side and tonight become hot and become fervent and become fully yielded and become consecrated, surrender to the Lord. Then I'll be happy, he said. Now Jesus said, all I can say about you is that you are lukewarm. And with all your profession of saying that you have need of nothing, can I tell you your condition? And he began to tell them their conditions. Number one, he said, you are wretched. What does that mean? When he said, you are wretched in Romans chapter 7. I'm looking at Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, verse 24. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? That's what Jesus was saying about them. That actually, their spiritual condition made them wretched in the sight of the Lord. When it says wretched, I want you to see, go back to verse 15. For that which I do, Allah, which I do, I allow not. For what I would, I do not. But what I hate that I do, wretched man that I am. If I do that which I would not, I consent to the law that the law is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me, wretched man that I am. 
For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good sin, for to will is present with me. I know how to take decision. I know how to, I will say, I make up my mind. I will never do that again. But the grace to do it I don't have, O wretched man that I am. He said then, to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would do and that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. O wretched man, that I am. That's what Jesus was saying. He said, Laodiceans, have you not checked up your life? That the good, good things that Paul the apostle taught you, that the good, good things written in those epistles that were sent to you, you cannot do them. And you are living in sin, and it is like you are compelled to live in those sinful lives. Wretched people that you are. Then he said, apart from being wretched, number two, they were miserable. What does that mean when he said they were miserable? First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19. In First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19, if in this world only we have hope in Christ, we are all men the most miserable. We are rich. We're increasing in goods. We have need of nothing. Ah, uh -uh. since I came to church, the Lord has provided a job for me. Now that's all the testimony. Um, now I bought a piece of land now. That's all the testimony. And I'm planning to build a house now. That's all the testimony. And look at me. When I came to this place, I didn't have a bicycle. Now I have a motor vehicle. That's all the testimony. If in this world only, all we can say is that I'm rich. I've got a job. And things are going on well for me. And we do not have the hope of heaven. We do not have the hope of seeing the Lord when he comes. We are not going to make the rapture because all we have is the riches and the goods and the wealth and the material things. We are of most men, the most miserable of all men. That's why Jesus said, you do not know. If all that you have is physical, material, material things, the real thing that gets you to heaven, you do not have, you are. Number one, wretched. Number two, you are miserable. Number three, he said they were poor. What, what did it mean when they were poor? He said, your money cannot buy your salvation. All that your money can buy, when you die and you are buried, all those things are forgotten. The real treasure, the real salvation, the real sin, the priceless sin that gets you to heaven, your money cannot buy. You cannot buy the peace of mind, the salvation of God, and relationship with God, and fellowship with God. Aren't you poor then? When you cannot buy redemption, all that you have gone, that you are rejoicing about, will it get you to heaven? How poor you are in Psalm 49. Psalm 49. I'm reading to you from verse 6. They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches. None of them can by any means redeem his brother or give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their soul is precious and it ceases forever. You are poor. You don't have that which will buy salvation or redemption. And aren't you blind? Aren't you blind? Uh, do you see God? Because blessed are the pure in heart. They shall see God. With all your money, are you seeing God? Are you seeing the grace of God? Are you seeing the love of God? Have you seen the salvation of the Lord? Have you seen the mighty hand of God reaching down to your soul and doing something that money cannot do? When you look at the condition of your soul, wouldn't you say you are blind? In First John chapter 2, First John chapter 2, I'm reading there to you in verse 11. First John Chapter 2, verse 11. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and he walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness has blinded his eyes. How many of us here would say, well, I, I thank God for my life. I thank God for my Christian faith. I thank God for my Christian profession. I thank God since I came to this church, I know the Bible. Since I came to this church, things are very different. In fact, even if there were no retreats and no Bible studies and no Sunday worship and no preaching from anybody, what I know now, I know, I know enough. I'm increased with groups. Everything is okay for me. And there's hatred in your heart. And there's malice in your heart. And you do not know that you are blind. And the darkness of hatred has blinded your eyes. That's what Jesus was talking to them about. In 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, reading in verse 9. He that lacketh these things is blind. What things? 
is talking about that from verse 5 when he says you, you have faith, you have virtue, you have knowledge, you have temperance, you have patience, you have godliness, and you have brotherly kindness, you have charity. He says, he that lacks all those things is blind and cannot see afar off, and he has forgotten that was purged from his old sins. That's what he meant when he said they were blind. And then he said they were naked. You know why he said they were naked? The clothes, the, the clothes of the garment of salvation they didn't have. And the sin that will cover their soul, close their soul, so that their shame will not be seen. That is the, the shame of their sin. The shame of original depravity in them will not be known. The clothes that will close them, the garment of righteousness or the robe of righteousness, they didn't have. And that's why it says in Isaiah chapter 61 verse 10, Isaiah 61 verse 10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garment of salvation and covered me with the robe of righteousness. That they didn't have. Righteousness, salvation, they didn't have. They were naked. Their souls were naked. And yet they were saying, everything is all right. Everything is all right. Uh, you came to this church. And you just joined the church, you removed jewelry, and then you began to tie scarf, and you think that's salvation. And there was no repentance. There was no change of life. There was no transformation. There was no assurance in your heart. You cannot point to the day and the time and the place where you confessed all your sins and God forgave you and things became totally different that now if any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. All things are passed away. All things are become new. And you're just moving with the crowd and just following the people. You'll be surprised when the trumpet shall sound. You will not have the garment of salvation or the robe of righteousness to cover your soul. And you'll be naked in the sight of the Lord. And then you'll go to a lost eternity. Come back to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3 from verse 15. It says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou art cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because, because you are saying, thou sayest I'm rich, and increase with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Uh, here, if you, as you look at the scriptures, you'll see that uh, when we're like this, we're neither here nor there. It's not a situation that pleases the Lord. If you look at Hosea chapter 10, Hosea chapter 10, I'm reading to you from verse 2. In Hosea chapter 10, verse 2, their heart is divided. Now shall they be found faulty. When your heart is divided, you are not fully for God. You are not totally for God. You are not sold out to God. You are not completely consecrated unto God. You are neither here nor there. You are not an enemy. You are not a friend. You are not an opposer. You are not an adversary. But you are not a disciple. And you are not in the center of the will of God. You are just at the periphery. What he's saying is that your heart is divided. And you are found guilty and faulty in the sight of God. In Osea chapter 7. Osea chapter 7, reading from verses 8 and 9. Ephraim has mixed himself among the people. Ephraim is a cake not turned. Although you come here for fellowship and worship and Bible study, you mix with all these other charismatics and tongue speaking people, prosperity people, and nominal Christians, and careless Christians, and blaspheming Christians, and the people that do not stand on the word of God. You are a friend to everybody. A friend to the people that don't believe holiness. You are a friend to the people that believe in holiness. You are a friend to the people that do not practice restitution. You are a friend to the people that say they believe restitution. You are a friend to everybody. You have mixed yourself with the people, a cake not turned. Strangers have devoured his strength, and he knoweth it not. Yea, gray ears are here and there upon him, yet he knoweth it not. The sign of the old nature is upon him. He doesn't care. He doesn't worry. He doesn't think about it. 
what a terrible condition. And in such a terrible condition, the Lord is saying, he is not happy with such a condition. Being lukewarm, let's, let's know where you are. Let, let the Lord know where you are standing. If you want to really stand, then stand and give yourself fully unto the Lord. In Numbers chapter 32, verse 11. Numbers 32, verse 11. Surely none of the men that came up out of Egypt from 20 years old and upward shall see the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, because they have not wholly followed me. They have not fully followed me. They have not wholeheartedly followed me. They have not passionately followed me. They have been here and there, so-so Christians, so-so believers, so-so followers. They are not opposed. They are not in the forefront. They are not zealous. They are not totally dead. They are not in Egypt. They are not in Canaan. They die in the wilderness. All those people that left the land of Egypt... They will not be able to inherit the land because they have not wholeheartedly followed the Lord. What the Lord is expecting is that with all your heart and with all your soul, you'll follow the Lord. There will be no half an hour. There will be no, well, I'm trying my best. I'm doing my best. I cannot, well, in the world in which we live now, money is everything. If you don't have money, you don't have a job, you don't have education, you don't do this and do that, how are you going to make it in this world in which we are living? I'll be coming to church, but don't bother me. I, I can't go as far as you are talking about. Not every Everybody is going to be, you know, saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost and passionate and on fire for the Lord. I cannot be like that. If you cannot be like that, you cannot get to the land of Canaan. You will not get to heaven. Because it says, because you are lukewarm and you are neither cold nor hot, you will not make it. The people that will get to heaven are the people that have abandoned everything. Because when you lay your hands on the plow and you look back, you will not get to the kingdom of God. It's a serious matter. A backslider that is just managing, just patching up, will not make it. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 14. In Proverbs 14, 14, here it tells us the backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. And he will be full of self-praise. Self-congratulation. I'm all right. Things are going well for me. The backslider in heart. Filled with his own ways. But he says, a good man shall be satisfied from himself. He'll withdraw from self-praise. From himself. And that's what the Lord is telling us. And you see what the Lord said there. That because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. That's what Jesus said. Don't mind those people that say, once you are saved, you are forever saved. Once you are a child of God, you are forever a child of God. Nothing like that. Because you are neither cold nor hot, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. It says in John chapter 15, John chapter 15, verse 2, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bear more fruit. Verse 6 tells us, if, him not, if a man abide not in me. When you're abiding in Christ, salvation will be there. When you're abiding in Christ, holiness will be there. When you're abiding in Christ, obedience will be there. When you're abiding in Christ, faithfulness will be there. When you're abiding in Christ, the life of Christ will be visible. We can see it. But when those things are not there, you are not abiding in the Lord. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire. And they are burnt. It tells us, uh, you know, there are, there are people that feel that once your name is in the book of life, it's there forever. But Jesus is saying no, because you are neither cold nor hot. And remember, these were people that Paul the Apostle referred to as brethren. In Colossians, where I read to you at first. But they came to the situation where the Lord said, no, they were not measuring up now. I'm going to spew them out of my mouth. There's only one remedy. They must repent. Because he's standing at the door and he's knocking. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and sup with him, fellowship with him. Look at Exodus chapter 33, chapter 32. Exodus 32, verse 33. Mark this in your Bible. Mark it for yourself. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever, whosoever, you know, there are times that some believers, they get to the point where they feel, because of who I am, 
And they think that the honor we give them is the honor God is giving them. Well, they think that the respect that we give them, because we're human beings, and if we have known somebody for a long time, and a fellow is active, and a fellow is a churchman, and a fellow is doing this and doing that, we always keep on saying, brother, brother, sister, sister. Or sometimes we say yes, sir, to them. And because we're always saying yes, sir, yes, sir, to them, they don't count themselves as part of the whosoever. And therefore, they begin to live careless lives, disobedient lives, unholy lives, unrighteous lives. And they feel it doesn't matter because of who I am. Who are you? Because Paul the Apostle said, I put my body under so that after I preach to other people, I myself will not be cast away. Paul the Apostle knew that he was part of the whosoever, no matter how hot you have been, how fervent you have been, how zealous you have been, how passionate you have been, how prayerful you have been, how righteous and holy you have been, if you go back from the Lord, he will spew you out of his mouth. That's why it says in verse 33, whosoever have sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. That's what the Lord is saying. He's saying, Lord, this same church, you know something? You were there before. You knew the grace of God before, but now I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Oh, they understood. They understood. Because he was talking in a the language they really understood because Laodicea was not far from Colossae and from Herapolis. In the district of Herapolis, there was hot mineral springs. Water coming out of the spring will be transported to Laodicea over land in conduits, that is in pipes. But those pipes were on the ground, not buried underneath. And so the sun will be shining. By the time that water reached Laodicea, it was no longer hot, it was lukewarm. The same thing, cold water, was found in Colossae. And that cold water from Colossae will be piped to um, Laodicea. And by the time it got to Laodicea, again, it was lukewarm. Anybody that tried to drink, it will be so nauseating. And when they try to drink, they will spill the water out. And Jesus said, exactly what I'm going to do to you if you keep on being lukewarm. Unfortunately, you know, for this church, for that Laodicean church, Christ had nothing to comment in them in their lukewarm nauseating condition they had lost everything worthy of praise their christian profession was flabby anemic they were not on fire for christ they had compromised their christian conviction and zeal and they felt comfortable and complacent they boasted that they were still rich and that they really and they were really poor in the sight of God. The city of Laodicea, would you know, was a banking, a wealthy banking center. And the spirit of marketing, the spirit of the marketplace, the spirit of, of the world had gone taking hold of the hearts of the people. They are proud and rich in store. Straw. That is the straw that you use in building these huts. They were rich in that that could be burnt up. They were not rich in having the gold of faith and the gold of the Christian life and the gold of righteousness. And although Christ threatened them that will vomit them out of his mouth, he was still offering them an opportunity that if they will repent, things will still be all right. That leads us to point number two Christ's prescriptions. To the lukewarm church and to the lukewarm Christian too. Christ's prescriptions to the lukewarm. We come back to Revelation chapter 3. In Revelation chapter 3, I'm looking at verse 18. Revelation chapter 3, verse 18. Here are the words of Jesus Christ to them and to you today. In verse 18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and why treatment? that thou mayest be closed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with thy self, that thou mayest be rich. He told them that here is what they will do. Now, he, he used that word by, but please understand, he said, by of me. He is in heaven, we are on earth, and we cannot buy anything from him with money. 
In fact, he tells us, when he tells us to buy, he's not telling us to buy with money. You're not going to buy the grace of God with money. You're not going to buy salvation with money. You're not going to buy righteousness with money. You cannot buy peace, peace with God, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. You cannot buy that with money. You cannot buy the ticket to get to heaven. You cannot buy that with money. What does he mean then? Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55, reading from verse 1. Oh, everyone that thirsteth, you are desirous. You now know your need. And you are thirsty. And you say, yes, this is what I want. I cannot go on without salvation. I cannot go on without a real definite experience and relationship with the Lord. I cannot go on in this cold situation, lukewarm situation. I want to be on fire for the Lord. Everyone that has said, come ye to the waters. And he that has no money, come ye buy. You don't have money. Come and buy. There's no money. You are not dealing with God. You are not transacting business with God with money. He that has no money, come ye buy. Each and ye, ye, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. It says it again. It's without money. Without money. How do you buy it then? You buy it with repentance. You buy it with tears, with agony in your heart. You buy it with a contrite heart. You buy it with consecration. You buy it with turning your back on your past. Turning your back on the self-praise and the complacency. Turning your back on all those uh, congratulations of yourself. And then you come in abject poverty before the Lord in total repentance. That's how you buy. In verse 2 it says, Wherefore do you spend your money for that which is not bread? And your labor for that which satisfies not, hacking diligently unto me, and eat, eat ye, that that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness, incline your ears, and come unto me here, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. That's what he's calling you to in Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs chapter 23, reading from verse 23, buy the truth and sell it not. Buy the truth and sell it not. How do you buy the truth? Oh, by giving your time. That's how you buy the truth. By sitting down during the Bible study, that's, that's how to buy the truth. By blocking your mind away from anything that will not allow the truth to penetrate into you. That's how you buy the truth. By sitting down there and not allowing any distraction. Uh, thinking about this one at home and that one at home and that one that I left at home. You are not thinking about any other thing. You are concentrating. It's with concentration and consecration and abandonment and desire. Passionate desire for the things of the Lord and all the things that will hinder you from getting the truth of the Lord, you push them aside. You say, the only thing I want is this truth of the word of God. I want you to do good in my soul. That's how you buy the truth. The desire, the passion, the zeal, the consecration, the total abandonment, and pushing aside every other thing that will hinder you from getting the best of God. Buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. In verse 26, my son, give thine heart to me. That's how you buy it. Give your heart to me. Give your affection to me. Give your totality to me. And let thine eyes observe my ways. Did you hear this parable before? It's in Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. Reading from verse 44, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a, unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he had found one great, one pearl of great price, he went and he sold all that he had and bought it. Went and sold all that he had and bought it. What does that mean? He went to sell all that he had and he bought the goodly pearl of great price. Let me show you what it means. Philippians chapter 3. In Philippians chapter 3, it says in verse 7, but what things were gained to me? Those I counted laws for Christ. Paul the apostle, when he came to know the Lord Jesus Christ, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Who art thou, Lord? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the pricks. And he said, Lord, what shall I do? Go to Damascus. It will be showing you what you will do. At that point, he had a price to pay. He had something to consider. Because he was a Pharisee. And because he was a member of the Sanhedrin. 
He was one of the great rulers in Israel. And he had been one of the people that would get letters of authority and persecute the church. He was a man of great honor and great position among the people. When he met Jesus Christ, he said all that position, all that honor, all that exaltation among men, all the things that I had that I could reach the religious highest level at any time, I abandoned them. What things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Tonight as you are here. Are there things in your life that compete with the love of God? That compete with seriousness and zeal and faith in the Lord? With fire in your soul? And those things are hindering you. They will not allow you to move forward. You're too self-conscious. You're conscious about my position, my honor, my ability, my job, my family, my beauty, my handsomeness, my this, my that. Abandon them. That's how you buy from the Lord. When you abandon all those things and nothing matters to you anymore, what things were gained to me? Those I counted laws for Christ. Yet doubtless, I count all things but laws for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. That's it. That's what the Lord is talking about. What did he tell them to buy by the way? It's as the doctor prescribes medicine to a sick human body. That's the way the great physician, the Lord Jesus Christ, is prescribing here remedy to this sick, anemic, spiritual body, this local church, and, and you Christian there too. For their lukewarmness, Christ prescribes zeal and repentance. Be zealous and repent, he said. And for their spiritual poverty and wretchedness and misery, he was telling them to buy from him, not from the world, to buy not from the supermarket, to buy not from the market, gold tried in the fire, refined in the fire, so that they'll be rich in faith and they'll be rich towards God. For their spiritual nakedness, he wanted them, he counseled them to buy, to get from him, why treatment, the robe of righteousness. And he'll get that from him. Then he said, for their spiritual blindness, he wanted them to have eyes salve, so that they will be able to have spiritual eyes restored, and they'll be able to see clearly the vision of eternal realities. You see, the gold here is not the gold people put in their ears, on their necks, in their hands. It's emblematic of pure religion, undefiled before God. If you look at Second Peter, why don't you turn to First Peter rather? In First Peter chapter one, you'll see the gold he was talking about. In First Peter chapter one, verse seven. First Peter chapter one, verse seven. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes. The gold, the faith, the faith and the gold. He is pretty comparing both of them together. And he says, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And that's the gold he was talking about. It tells us then that uh, we ought to, uh, you ought to have the gold of faith. That's pure, pure religion. And not only that, he wanted them to have the garment, the garment of righteousness. If you look at Psalm 132, Psalm 132, he spoke about the garment. We read something about that before in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10. Now Psalm 132, verse 9. Let thy priests be clothed with righteousness, and let thy saints shout for joy. And you go to verse 16, I will also close a priest with salvation. And a saint shall shout aloud for joy. When you think about this garment, this robe of righteousness, you look at Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. In Revelation 19 verse 8, you see what the garment is talking about, or the raiment is talking about. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And that's what Jesus Christ wanted those people to have. The righteousness of the saints. And then he said that uh, they should have their uh, eyes salves. So that they will anoint their eyes. And so that they will be able to see. Of course you know that it's not that they were physically blind, but they were spiritually blind. 
in their spiritual blindness and they couldn't see a lot of things number one they couldn't see the love of god number two they couldn't see the provision of the gospel number three they couldn't see the loveliness of the person and the work of christ number four they didn't see the beauty of holiness number five they didn't see the glory of present relationship with god number six they didn't see the glory of future relationship with christ and because they were blind to spiritual realities that's why the lord said come and buy buy of me all this when you buy these things then you will see in ephesians chapter 3 ephesians chapter 3 verses 8 and 9 in ephesians chapter 3 unto me chapter 3 verse 8 unto me who am less than the least of saints is given this grace that I should preach among you, among the Gentiles, the unsearchable riches of Christ. When it says that they will be rich, that's what he meant. The unsearchable riches of Christ. And to make all men see your vision, spiritual eyesight. Now you can see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. And then in chapter 1 of uh, Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that she may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his part. That's what, what he wants you to see toward us who believe according to the walking of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. We'll come to point number three now. Christ's precept and promise to the lukewarm. Christ's precept. In Revelation chapter 3, Revelation chapter 3, reading from verse, reading from verse 19. Many, many of these people as they listen to the Lord Jesus Christ and they, they heard the notes and the details of the letter, the epistle he wrote to them. It's possible that some of them might be surprised because they, their concept about Jesus Christ is that humble and gentle and meek and nice and loving and compassionate and permissive Lamb of God that, that never rebukes anyone. That just pats everybody at the back, whether cold or hot or lukewarm or insincere or hypocritical or whatever. And the concept that some people have about Jesus Christ is that he'll just let you go your way. And whatever you are doing, he doesn't mind at all. It's a gentle, meek lamp of God. And many of them might have been surprised. Is this coming from Christ? Because it's so sharp and it's so right to the point. And it's like probing and looking at the wounds that they had and the dirty things in their lives. And it's saying, change. If you don't change, something is coming. I'm going to cast you away from the kingdom, spill you away from my mouth. Is this Christ? Yes, it's Christ. That's why he said in verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasing. Did you ever know that Jesus Christ rebukes and that he chases? And he does that out of love. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasing. And we need to understand that. It is when the Lord loves us, that's when he rebukes us, he corrects us. If you look at Proverbs chapter 3, Proverbs chapter 3, you, you'll see what this is saying in verse 12. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth. Even as a father, the son, in whom he delighted. That's love. That's love. When we, when we see that you are backsliding, when we see that you are becoming prayerless, when we see that you are becoming a talkative, when we see that your life, the fire in your life is going out, and now you are dead, you are cold, or you are lukewarm, we need to talk to you because we love you. When we see that you are on your way to heaven before, but now you are not on your way to heaven, it's like the things of this world, they are hindering you and disturbing you. We need to talk and call you and say, come on here. It's difficult to call you a brother now. Difficult to call you a sister now because things are not 
not all right in your life. Don't smile. Don't laugh. Things are terrible. Things, they didn't, you need an urgent cure to this spiritual lethargy and lukewarmness in your life. Look at Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 20. Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 20. Is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a pleasant child? For since I speak against him, since I speak against him, I do honestly remember him still. Therefore my bowels are troubled for him. I will surely have mercy upon him, says the Lord. You see the compassion of the Lord, the love of the Lord. Yes, I spoke against him because it wasn't going well. It wasn't doing right. And my bowels are just troubled within me and I still remember him because I love him but I need to chastise him so that he will repent and he will turn in Hebrews chapter 12 Hebrews chapter 12 I'm reading to you from verse 5 Hebrews chapter 12 verse 5 and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children my son despise not the chastening of the Lord and faint not when thou art rebuked of him Faint not when thou art rebuked of him. You know, there are some people, they get used to, well done. That's good. That's great. You're doing fine. Everything is all right. They get used to praise. They get used to exaltation. They get used to honor. That whenever things go wrong, you have to say, ah, that should not be. That should not be. That, that's not right. You have not done well today. Then they're all troubled. And it's like you become an enemy. And the Laodiceans might be having an idea like that. That's what Jesus said. As many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. In verse 6, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Oh, you say, but isn't it going to be a wonderful thing if, um, you know, even if things are going wrong, we just leave people as they are. And we don't talk to them, we don't rebuke them, we don't correct them, we don't chastise them. And don't you think that that will really bring love and fellowship among us and that will be wonderful? Well, God does that. God does that. There are some people that God abandons, that he doesn't talk to them, he doesn't, he doesn't rebuke them. After he has rebuked and rebuked and chastised and corrected, and he will not bulge and they will not change. Look at your Bible, Osea chapter 4 verse 17. Hosea chapter 4, verse 17. Do you remember Ephraim? When he said, Is Ephraim my child, my beloved, pleasant child? Since I rebuked him, my bowels are troubled within me. I want to have mercy on him. I hope he will repent. Look at this now. In Hosea chapter 4, verse 17, Ephraim, that same Ephraim, at a later time, after rebuke, after correction, after chastisement, but there's no change. Ephraim is joined to idols. Can we go and warn him? No, let him alone. It's gone beyond the line. It's crossed the line. He doesn't want rebuke. If you rebuke him, chastise him, and correct him, you want him to get to heaven, he becomes your enemy. And he will even, he can do anything. Let him alone, let him alone. It's like John the Baptist why are you talking to Herod that he has married him, you know, the wife of his brother? He's not going to listen. Why are you wasting your time? In fact, you can even destroy your ministry by talking to somebody who has made up his mind. He's not going to repent. He's not going to get to heaven. He's married that person, and your correction is not going to change him. Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. And how John the Baptist should have left um, Herod alone and continued in his ministry and not allow that man that didn't have any intention to repent or to get to heaven in that his ministry or cut short his life. And then we're reading Matthew chapter 15. Here is even Jesus Christ himself. Matthew chapter 15. I'm reading to you from verse 14. Matthew chapter 15, verse 14. Let them alone. Pharisees, let them alone. Sadducees, let them alone. Religious leaders, let them alone. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Go and preach to the people who want to hear, let them alone. In Romans chapter 1, verse 28. Romans chapter 1, verse 28. Here in Romans chapter 1 verse 28, here is what the word of the Lord is saying. Even as they did not like, as they did not like, 
As they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. My brother, my sister, friends who are here tonight, invitees who are here, the correction will not continue forever. Because God loves and because Jesus loves, he rebukes, he chastises. If we repent and turn to the Lord, well and good. But if we remain adamant, the correction will not continue forever. A time comes when God says, preacher, leave them alone. They've chosen what they want to choose, the way they want to go. Let them alone and speak to the people that want to hear. And so the Lord was talking to this church and he said, come back to Revelation chapter 3. As he rebuked them, the expected response he wanted from them and the expected result he wanted from the message he had sent to them. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. Be zealous therefore and repent. Christ reproved for their lukewarmness was the proof of his love for them. As a father in love will call back disobedient children and that will be a proof of that father's love. There is no higher proof of Christ's love than when he rebukes us to bring us back to the highway of holiness that leads to heaven. And so what he wanted from each of them and from each of us is that we'll be zealous and we will repent. What does that mean? That will be earnest. We'll turn to the Lord in true repentance. You will not lose any time or spare any labor or spare any effort. You will seek the Lord until you become totally free from your complacency and you obtain the grace of God and you become devoted to the Lord with unquenchable fire of the love of God burning in your soul. Then Christ says, I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking. If anyone hears my voice, then, and he opens the door, if I, if I have a good responsive heart, then I will come. For all those who open their heart's door, he will enter so that he can establish fellowship with them. The Lord is calling everyone to repentance. You look at your life and you see what the Lord is rebuking and correcting your life. He says, repent. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. Don't worry about terminology. I'm born again already. Don't worry about that. I'm a child of God already. Don't worry about that. The point is, you're lukewarm. The point is, there's no fire burning in your soul. The point is, your prayer life is in shambles. The point is, you cannot read the Bible by yourself in quiet time and gain anything. The point is, for the past one year, two, three years, you have not taken a definite decision that makes a definite mark upon your life and makes you to live a life that is extraordinary. The point is that in your life, in your Christian life, you are sleeping. The point is that you are blind. The point is that the Lord is not happy with your Christian life and your Christian profession. And what is calling up for you is not just terminology. I'm converted. I'm saved. I'm sanctified. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. Leave all the terminology alone. And it says, repent. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, uh, whom the heaven must receive until the time of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began. Uh, the Lord is saying that if we will do that, that the Lord himself, he will have mercy on us. I said you have mercy on us. In Second Chronicles chapter 7, Second Chronicles chapter 7, I'm reading from verse 14. Here are the words of the Lord. If my people, that is the people that are called by the name of the Lord, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. That's where we need to begin. And that's why it's, uh, it's, like, it's a terrible contradiction. We say we're children of God, but we cannot humble ourselves. We're so proud. We're even proud before God. We're proud before Jesus. As if we can hide anything from God. And then our prayer is a cover up. Oh God, you know. Oh God, you know. And he says, if my people who are called by my name, for this once, will abandon all that pride and all that hypocrisy and humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin. I will heal their land. In 2 
Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, here is a kind of repentance the Lord is watching, waiting for. It tells us in verse 10, it says, For godly sorrow. Walketh repentance. You become sorrowful about your coldness, your apathy, your lethargy, your self satisfaction, your self deception. You become sorrowful about that. You've seen your condition. You see what Jesus is saying. He loves you and he's disappointed in the way you are living. And then he says, Godless sorrow. Walketh repentance to salvation. Not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world bringeth death. How many today will be so sincere? As the Lord is saying, well, this is the condition of things in your life. This is the condition of things in uh, your spiritual profession. And he's asking for repentance. He says, now behold, I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking. If anyone will hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him. I'll fellowship with him and he with me. There's a stranger at the door of your heart right now. Let him in. He has been there often before. You've heard messages before. Let him in. Let him in before he's gone. Let him in. He's the Holy One. Jesus Christ, the Father's Son. Let him in. Open now to him your heart. Let him in. If you wait, he will depart. Because you don't have too much time. Let him in. Let him in. He's your friend. He, your soul, surely will defend. He will keep you to the end. Let him in. Hear you now his loving voice. As he calls upon you to repent, let him in. Now, oh now, make him your choice. Let him in. He's standing at your door. Joy to you he will restore. And his name you will adore. Let him in. Now, admit him, this heavenly guest. Let him in. He will make you a feast. He will sup with you. Let him in. He will speak your sins forgiven. And when all ties of earth are riven, broken. He will take you home to heaven. Let him in. He's challenging you now that you should open the door of your heart and let Jesus come in. Rise up and let us pray. Behold, I stand at the door and I'm knocking. If anyone hears my voice and he opens the door, I will come into him, sup with him, fellowship with him. Before you go, open the door, let him in.